We're starting a, a short series of lessons talking about outreach and, and our a call from God to go out and represent him to this world. Now, when the church was first starting, uh, the worst uh, persecutor that they dealt with, the, the one who caused the most trouble, the one who caused the most violence, was, uh, was a man named Saul. Saul uh, was so effective at, at, at working on the church that, that it gives him, the, the Bible says in Acts uh, chapter 9, that he was destroying the church. Um, it never gives that much credit to any other persecutor that, that they have to deal with. Paul was, was really wiping a lot of the movement out. And, and, and not just in, in Jerusalem and not just in Israel, but he was starting to take, take it uh, further away to other cities that, that, that were kind of far away from Jerusalem uh, to try to arrest and, and or persecute or, or kill the Christians who were there. And while he was on his way to Damascus, while he was on his way to, to that city, uh, God appeared to him uh, through Christ. And, and it wasn't like a vision. It wasn't like a dream or anything like that. Paul believed that he saw the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus, that, that Jesus came and personally uh, appealed to him, personally called to him to change his life. For three days after that vision, uh, Paul uh, stayed by himself. Uh, he didn't eat, he didn't drink, and we don't know what exactly he was thinking or what exactly he was praying about, but, but it seems like, uh, based on how he responds after those three days, that it was all about, God, I have no idea how I missed what you were doing. I have no idea, God, how it was that I was heading so far the other direction. And, and, and this, 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 this uh, hunger to give God thanks for all of his mercy. Paul talks about this sort of thing in one of his last letters, in 1 Timothy, he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Here's a trustworthy saying, Paul says, that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I'm the very worst. But for that reason that I'm the very worst of sinners and that he came to get me. For that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. So Paul believed that, that God came after him personally as, as a means to show his grace, that if, if God could come after somebody like me, and I'm the very worst of sinners, I mean, he's a blasphemer and a, and a persecutor, a violent man, if God would come after me, then it proved in Paul's mind that God really cares about people and that God will go to any length to reach people. And Jesus had told us that this was how it was in, in stories like the prodigal son, that, that God never gets tired of seeking those people who were far away. Jesus said about himself that the reason why he came was to seek and save the lost. And, then, and now Paul caught that vision, you know, this idea that, that okay, uh, God, I was heading the other direction, I was hellbound, and you loved me so much, you cared about me so much that you considered me trustworthy, even when I wasn't that you called me to your service even when I didn't deserve it, and, and, uh, and it changed him. Paul went from being the worst persecutor in the, to the church to being its biggest advocate, its biggest missionary. He, he writes, he or one of his uh, associates writes about half of the New Testament, and, and, and it all came from that, that moment when Christ cared enough to come and, and get him. And he cares for you too. You matter to God. Um, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, no matter what you might offer or not offer uh, to his kingdom or to the church or to anybody, uh, you matter to God. And he has went to every possible length to catch your attention. He has went to every possible length to get you to look his direction. Um, he loves you. I read a thing a, a couple of days ago in, a, in an article where it talked about the precision that this universe has put together, that, that, uh, that, that the distance between the stars and the distance between the planets is exactly the distance it needs to be. If it was any closer, the planets uh, wouldn't have formed, and if it was any further away, they wouldn't have orbited like they needed to orbit. I mean, it was all perfectly calibrated. 
Our earth is exactly the right tilt and exactly the right uh, spin to, to, to take full advantage of the sun. And if either of those things were off just a little bit, life wouldn't be possible here. When you look at, at the precision, that how many things had to go on, that used to, the, the thinking was there's probably life on, on lots of other planets. But, but when we realize how ridiculously hard it is to make life occur, it makes a person start to wonder again or see again how much God loves us. God designs this entire galaxy and this entire uh, planet. The, the deeper we dig into science, the more we see his design, and we can see that God really, really, really cares about us. And that, that you matter to God. Now, when Paul got a hold of that, like I said, it, it changed his life. He started looking at people different. And he talks about that in, uh, in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, Christ's love compels us. That's a pretty important word, uh, uh, th this word compels. It, it, it can mean constrains or, uh, or uh, 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 controls. It, it could have the idea of a preoccupation. Christ's love preoccupies us. Or, or even the idea of being hemmed in. Like, I can't get away from this thought. Christ's love. And so partly you got to understand Paul's vantage point, right? Paul says, I was going the other direction as hard as I could, and Christ came for me. And when I realized that Christ was going to give me a second chance after all the bad things I'd done, well, he says that compels us. And your testimony might be a little bit different than that, but I bet there's a lot of, of touch points in Paul's example, and Paul, who wrote this, that probably hits you too. Christ's love compels us. It constrains us. It, it preoccupies us because we're convinced that, that he died for us. And therefore, we died. I, I mean, because of the gift that he gave to me, because he laid his life down for me, then I'm willingly going to lay my life down to follow after him. And he died for all, that those who live uh, should no longer live for themselves, but for him who, who died for them and who rose again. I mean, you, you could take this too far and, and take a sort of a debtor's approach to this thing that, 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 uh, that, 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 we, that we have to pay God back or that we can pay God back. That's taking it a little too far. But this idea that, that we owe him or we should feel some compulsion, that seems like a pretty Pauline idea. You can't ever pay it back. The gift is too big. You can't ever do enough where we're suddenly that you've done more for your salvation than Jesus has. It's always going to be to his credit that we're saved. But, but when you realize the, the enormity of what he's done, it, it can't help but motivate you to say, man, if somebody gave me that kind of gift, what would I do back? I, I mean, if somebody buys me dinner, I feel like I need to take them out to dinner as soon as I can. If somebody buys me a, 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 a shirt or, 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 a, or gives me a nice card, then I feel like I need to return that favor. What, what then do you need to do for someone who laid their very life down for you? Who shed their own only? Who shed their blood in, in the pursuit of, of bringing you to glory? And what what kind of debt does that create in a person's heart? He died for all that we wouldn't live for ourselves any longer. And so he says, so, and that's kind of the idea of therefore, because he did that, because we're compelled, right? Because of all the things he's doing, we don't look at anybody with a worldly point of view anymore. Paul's going to talk about this in other places, but I don't look at people uh, to see uh, their, their, their class or their gender or, their, or, or their, what their resources are or their race. I don't, I don't consider those things any longer. That's how we mark each other in a worldly way. I mean, we're all time divided in terms of the haves and the have-nots or, or the whites and the blacks or, 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 or this thing or that thing. But I don't do that. He says, he says we once regarded Jesus like that, but I'm not going to do it anymore. I once just thought he was a misguided teacher, but now I know he's the Lord of life. He says, if anyone's in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Paul says everybody is full of this enormous potential. I don't know who you would look at and say, you know, not that the, you would never probably think this in your head even, but they're beneath me. You, you probably never think that consciously but but there are certain people that we treat that way right the, the 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 person who who waits at us waits on us at a table or the one who cleans our room or, or, or maybe the one who uh, uh is driving a little bit too slow in front of us in traffic or, or or the one who's who's taken so much time in front of us in line and it's very easy to look at that person like man if i could you know kick them to the side i sure would well, well paul says i used to do that too but i don't do it anymore because i realize that because of who jesus is I never lock eyes on anybody for whom Christ didn't die. 
I just don't look at them like I used to. He says, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. And he's going to use that word again here down below. Reconciliation, that, that, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ and not counting people's sins against him. And he's committed that message to us. Reconciliation is just peacemaking. You know, hopefully in the next couple of days, Ukraine and Russia will sit down to reconcile their differences and try to figure it out. How can we make peace? How can we communicate and, and get this stuff done? Some of you, maybe in, in, in different arenas of your life, desperately need to sit down and reconcile the differences. Maybe in your marriage or with your kid or with your parents or with your uh, uh, co-workers. Well, God has offered that reconciliation to us, right? God has come down and said, let's work out our differences. And he doesn't have to because he's God. He doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to bend at all. But not only does he come to us, he comes to us first. He makes the first offer. How about if I just pay for everything? <laughs> That's the offer. And in exchange for paying for everything, you come along and follow me. Do I have to be perfect? Well, no, you can't. Do I have to get it all straightened out? Well, no, there's no way to get that all straightened out. But God says, I love you so much that I'll just pay for all of it. And you come follow me. And, and, and following him is not a burden. I mean, there's never been any time when I followed after God and after doing it thought, man, what a waste that was. You know, I wish I hadn't been so generous. wish I hadn't been so kind, but well, that was a waste. I wish I hadn't learned how to love like that. I mean, his ways are always the best ways. So not only is he going to pay for everything, but the thing he asked me to do in return works out to be for my own good, and I have no regret after doing it. This ministry of reconciliation, he explains, he says, we are therefore, because of reconciliation, we're Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We're his ambassadors, we're his representatives. The president appoints somebody to be his ambassador in, in Thailand or Britain or, or, or Ukraine or, or any other number of places. And while you're there, then you represent the White House and you represent his interests. And if it comes to a place where you kind of disagree with him and you're not on the same page with the president any longer, then you can't do that job anymore. You're only there to represent his interests. That's the deal we're offered in reconciliation. He's going to pay for everything, but we're going to follow hard after him. We're going to trust that he knows how to live our lives better than we do. And then Paul uh, anchors all this in a 23-word phrase, which is worth memorizing. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He's doing all this for us. Even though we're big sinners, even though we don't have it all straightened out, and he asks us to come and follow him and to be his ambassadors. And over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about that thing about you becoming a better ambassador, a better representative of Jesus. Now, I should mention, uh, as we get into this thing, that there's, a, there's some benefits and some costs uh, to doing it. And, and I guess if you were doing any big thing, it would be worth maybe writing down some costs and, and benefits uh, to what you're being asked to do to consider whether it's really worth it when you consider all the stuff you've got to pay. And there are some real costs, and there are some real benefits to be in Christ's ambassador. And I, I wanted to highlight a few of those if I could. One of the, the big benefits is this sense of purpose. I notice a lot of Christians who wonder why they're here. They know they're going to heaven one day, but between today and that day, whenever that day is, what am I doing here? I mean, you go to church for a while and you try to read your Bible and you try to pray, but, but you've soaked all this in and now it just seems like, well, okay, I got most of that. What else is there? Is this all it is? Just learning until I die? Is, is that all? Just go to a few classes, you know, uh, take in a few seminars? You're for more than that. You're his ambassador. You're his representative. You've been sent here into this dark world to, to do for others what that bright light did for Paul. You're to call them back to him. And when you do that, you're going to feel this real sense of, of purpose. You're going to feel it like you're a tool in God's hand, and it's going to make all the other stuff start to make more sense. You'll do it. Uh, one of the benefits is fulfillment. Uh, when you make a decision to follow hard after Christ, it, 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 it livens your spirit. Jesus said that when he talks to the Samaritan woman in John 
in John 4, and he, and he gets her to come back to God. And the disciples come and say, hey, what are you doing talking to somebody like that? And Jesus says to them, my food is to do the will of God. Like, it's my energy comes from that. Jesus got fulfillment out of being an ambassador to God, and we'll get fulfillment from it too. It makes you grow. Um, you can't help but grow. Uh, when I'm evangelizing, when I'm telling people about him and, and letting people know what he's about, I want to read. I want to pray. I need the energy of it. I need him to watch me. I, I'll be praying for courage all the time. God, give me opportunities. When I'm doing what I'm supposed to be as his ambassador, my spiritual life takes right off. And, and that's always a good thing. It's an investment and, and a good investment. Um, uh, uh, at different times during my life, I've talked to somebody who will help me try to invest my money or my resources in a way maybe that can, can make a little money back. And I don't have a lot of money, so it's usually a pretty short meeting. But, 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 but we'll talk about that. Or maybe that I shouldn't buy this kind of car, I should buy this kind of car, because this car has a little better resale. It's a better investment, you know. And, and we think about those things. But all those things, money and cars and houses, and it all's destined to fade. It, it starts rusting as soon as you bring it home. It just none of it will last. Uh, it's not meant to last. It's just a thing. But when I invest in somebody else and I help them understand who God is and help them understand what God's about, that's an investment that never, ever, ever fades away. Christians, if you've got kids and, and you've never shared the Lord with those kids and talked about how important your faith is to you, if you can get them to, 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 to understand that thing, that's an investment that will always pay off. You'll never regret it. It will always bear interest. And then one last uh, benefit, uh, if you make a decision to follow hard after him, you get the honor of being God's ambassador. There's it's not pride exactly, but the certain sense that I'm, I'm, I'm part of something. And I guess that goes to purpose and fulfillment too. There are some costs. Um, uh, one is, uh, is time and energy. Um, if you make a decision to, to reach people far from God, it's going to sap some time. You know, you might have planned to, to really binge on some Netflix show this weekend, but, but then there's this guy that you've been trying to witness to and he wants to get together, or, or this couple that you've kind of been sharing faith with and they'd like to meet and talk about it. Or, or maybe this was a Sunday you planned to go camping, but, but that's also the Sunday that the people you've been talking about said, okay, well, we'll go to church this week. And it will cost you some time and, and energy. Sometimes it'll cost you money. Um, you, you need to be picking up the bill for these, these coffees and these get-togethers. You, sometimes you'll go on a trip together, you know, so you have some time to talk, and you need to be generous with that. And it's not a fortune you're losing, but it will cost something. It's going to cost you preparation. Um, you're going to have to read and pray. I talked about these two things here kind of related. You'll grow from it, but, but I mean, I don't want to get away from the idea that you're going to have to study some you're going to have to pray some just to have the energy to do the things that you need to do one of the things that keeps a lot of people from doing it is the risk i mean if i open my mouth this way they might laugh at me they might reject me out of hand they might say they don't want to hang out with me anymore or they might not say it but they might just start pulling away some um i suppose it's even possible in our country to get some persecution for it and sometimes the fear of that keeps me away but think about how you came to this. Didn't somebody take that risk with you? And again, if this has eternal consequences, if this has eternal consequences, if it's an investment that's never, ever going to fade away, what are you holding all your chips for? I mean, what is it that you're, that you're hoping uh, to gain? Yeah, it's going to complicate your life. You're going to have to spend some time and energy and money. Yeah, it's going to... It's gonna, uh, it requires some effort ahead of time to get ready, and yeah, there's some risk, but I mean, what are you holding all these chips for? God has died for you. He's paid for everything. At the end of this life, they're going to bury your worn-out car carcass into the ground, but your soul is going to be lit up with him. He's paid for it all, and you're holding on. Jesus... Uh, uh, when he did pay for it all, when he was on the cross, they, he was crucified between two thieves. One of the thieves mocked him the whole time. 
you know, hey, teacher, it's really working out, isn't it? Love one another. Keep, keep preaching, preacher. Let them know what's going on. And he's just taunting him the whole time. If you really are this miracle worker we've been hearing about, how about getting us off these crosses? But the other guy, the other thief, and he might have jumped in on that at the beginning, but he's been watching Jesus. They've been hanging there for a lot of time. And, and Jesus, when anybody else would be cussing and yelling and screaming, he's, he's forgiven the guys who are killing him, even as they're gambling for his clothes. And, and, the, and the second thief is, is hit by that. And maybe he's seen Jesus before. Maybe he's heard some of these messages. Maybe both those guys had. And where it made the one guy laugh to see Jesus, who was this great love you know teacher of love and teacher of grace to see him actually dying with the with the other criminals it was hurting the second thief it was it was it was like like, like and he finally tells the first guy man you need to be quiet he, we deserve everything is coming to us i mean look at our lives i mean we're both the chief of sinners i mean it's a wonder we weren't put on these crosses years ago but this guy hasn't done anything and and while we're sinking into this despair it, it's like his spirit's different than ours and and then he turns to Jesus and he, and he says, he says, Lord, remember me. And it's almost like he's begging him, you know, God, after all I've done, is there any hope for somebody like me? And Jesus says, I tell you today, we'll be together in paradise. People matter to God. And they ought to matter to us. And that's our first lesson in this evangelism series.